folks, welcome back to Let's Play the Space Bar on the Mysterious JG. Last time we accomplished our first, well, accomplishment of the game. We actually finished Fleebix's little quest, and uh, we'd already done Thuds. You see our message light is flashing, but we can't read it in front of them, so let's get out of here and see what's going on with that. And uh, in case you're worried, uh, this is right where the disc load. After we switch discs, it drops you right on this screen. There's no dialogue with Fleebix after you finish, so you haven't missed a thing. Let's get right back into it. And open this up and listen to the message before our computer makes fun of us for having not noticed it already. Surveillance systems at Corporate HQ confirm multiple gunshot wounds inflicted on one of the conspirators. Analysis of the blood residue discovered nearby has yielded a positive I... I D what? D, thank you. The DNA in the blood is not that of a marmalai after all, mm -hmm. but of a kerpoopoo, a shapeshifter. Kerpoopoo? It's the blood of Nee Perth, the son of that intergalactic criminal mastermind, the late Nee Dopo. Consult the nearest computer terminal for a complete profile of this kerpoopoo. Remember, the suspect could now be virtually anyone in the bar. Well, boss, I guess we've got to scrap what we've got so far and start all over again. Sure, I'm glad she's got a sexy voice. Our computer, I mean. Alias? It's me, Max. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I, uh, I screwed up galactically. Uh... I was doing some residue printing, and someone hit me on the back of the head. When I came to, the bastard had tied me up and blindfolded me. <laughs> Luckily, I, I used the old trick of hiding my transmitter under my flaster sack, so I'm able to get this message to you. That sounds foul. Look, Alias, he says he's going to kill me if I don't tell him who you are. Of course, I, I never do that, buddy. You know me. <laughs> anyway, I think I've been moved from the premises, but I can't be too far away. Okay? Look, you gotta help me, Elias, because if Sarge finds out, she'll put me on target range duty. As a target, well, you, could, you gotta get me out of here, Elias. You could be killed, this too. This really right? stinks. All right. You gotta help me, Max. Don't ask how it happened. I die of embarrassment. You gotta get me out of here. This really stinks. Uh, what stinks? Being stuck in the Gordo or the Gordo itself? <laughs> Just help me, would you? Less joking, more pulling. All right, all right. Don't get your blood pressure up. It'll be harder to get you out. <laughs> Come on. Come on, Alice. One more. Push. Breathe. Push. Okay. So we got to rescue our buddy because he once pulled us out of some kind of alien toilet. That seems fair. At any rate, we got to find our way to the nearest computer terminal. We did see that it just got repaired. I believe, so, um, that's the theme bar, alright, forget about the theme bar, how do we get to, uh, how do we get back to the, uh, spaceport entrance here? There we go. Now, the Kerfufu and the, the name of the alien dude, probably these things are like puns that I'm not getting, but we will definitely... Uh, want to find out about... Well, you know what? Let's take a minute and find out about the kind of aliens we're going to be encountering here. Now, they mentioned Kerpoopoos. This race is essentially considered to be the most cold-bloodedly amoral of all the galaxy's sentient species, although Kerpoopoo do not go out of their way to cause pain, suffering, or death. They think nothing of inflicting such harm uh, for the slightest benefit. Their overriding physical characteristic of the Kerpoopoo is the ability to shapeshift in any form, including members of other races, since they have never allowed visitors to... Vi Never allowed visitors in the homeworld of Kerplatter. But yeah, see, the Kerpoopoo, Kerplatter. Get it? Poopoo Platter. The real appearance is a mystery. Millennia ago, the Kerpoopoo evolved the ability to transmit and receive information on frequencies so incredibly high that it seems like telepathy to other species. The Kerpoopoo is the only known race capable of transmitting on these frequencies, although the Niblitzi, with their antennae, are able to detect these transmissions. That is probably an important hint. Probably we've got to somehow get Fleebix to help us pick up a transmission, and he is probably... That's why we had to do his quest. But I'm just guessing. The transmissions have a range of roughly 500 feet. Kapupu can use this ability to send messages directly to high-frequency receivers, such as police scanners and PDAs. Before shape-shifting, the Kerpoopoo must obtain a neural analysis of the target creature, which is obtained through the use of a strange insect native to the Kerplatter called a Zetblug. 
A settle bug. A Krapupu will carry a supply of settle bugs, specially trained to transmit over the high frequencies which the Krapupu can receive if listening nearby. The insect, which has the appearance of a tiny glass shard, is attached, often using a blowgun, to a facial orifice of the target creature, usually the eyelid. Once in place, the insect crawls up into the ocular cavity and burrows painlessly into the target's brain, where it clamps on and begins transmitting. This serves as a neural scan, which provides the information necessary to perform the shape shift. This process takes about 100 ticks. Ticks is a time unit that I don't really understand in this game. The information received, retrieved cannot be stored, and thus the skin is, skin is a necessary precursor to every shapeshift. In other words, the Karpupa cannot keep a library of data. The shapeshift itself takes about half a tick. That's a convoluted way of setting the rules, but eh, you've got to have rules for your villain. The neural scan is not fatal, indeed not even detectable to the target creature, since the Zettel bug perishes harmlessly shortly after it completes its transmission. However, a Krapupu invariably kills the target creature just before or after its shapeshift, presumably to eliminate the confusion of having two copies of the same creature walking around. Often this is done via a slow-acting poison while the neural scan is in process. They sound like jerks. Shapeshifting does not alter a Krapupu's underlying DNA, so a DNA test such as residue printing can reveal a shapeshifted Krapupu. Voice printing cannot identify shapeshifted Krapupu unless the Krapupu is shapeshifted into a veg or a jaw, in which case the resulting anomaly will reveal the creature as a Krapupu. I don't know what veggies or zolls are. We might want to find out. Another way to detect a Krapupu is by the high energy burst they emit when they shapeshift. This burst is easily identified, even using household equipment. The Krapupu cannot change mass, and therefore the target creature must be of similar mass to the Krapupu. The Krapupu cannot shapeshift into non DNA based life forms, so robots and androids cannot be its target creature. Also, the length of time it takes Krapupu to download a target creature's DNA via high-frequency transmission significantly limits its shape-shifting opportunities. Unsurprisingly, the Krapupu race has produced a number of notorious criminals. The, these are dangerous creatures without the slightest compuncture above, against bloodshed on a planetary scale. The greatest ones are Negrop, Puzepo, and Publuk. Even greater was Nidopol. whose brutal criminal exploits were legendary. However, Nidopol is known to have perished several years ago during a get getaway flight through an asteroid storm. Before his death, Nidopal was the most wanted figure on 17 planets and responsible for nearly 300 recorded thefts of the combined estimated value of 20 billion nuggets. His crime has left hundreds dead, thousands homeless, and millions without cable TV reception. <laughs> During his final years, Nidopal was reportedly training his only son, Nee Perth, to follow in his criminal footsteps. However, there has been no sign of Nee Perth since his father's demise. Anybody feels like explaining the Nee Perth, Nee Dopal joke to me, uh, feel free. I don't get it, but I... I'm almost positive it's supposed to be a pun of some kind. Uh, Zazzle, they said they couldn't shift into. Oh, the bug guys. I do remember them from my previous play. Zazzle are a race of enormous centipede-like creatures, seven or eight feet in length. They are composed of many identical segments. Four front sections and four rear sections have two pincer-clad legs. That is insectoid with enormous bug eyes and hairy mandible. The awkward looking, while awkward looking, the Zazzle are quite nimble and can easily maneuver into chairs and phone booths. They can rock backwards on their hind segments and stand nearly upright, swaying slightly back and forth. The Zazzle speak in a hoarse, raspy voice, but can also communicate with members of their own species telepathically. More like telepathically. Boom! The telepathy man travels extremely far and occupies a single metal frequency, and thus the entire communities are all on the same giant party line. Other races regard this as an invasion of privacy, but to the Zhazhal as a sort of collective consciousness, and they use telepathy to constantly relay data back to the swarm. They live for the swarm. Zhazhal live in underground colonies on their home world of pizzazz. <laughs> nice. They often venture up to the surface on forays for food or for seemingly useful items that almost invariably turn out to be useless. But it is unheard of to not return to the colony by nightfall. Pizzazz is a rocky, mountainous world, and most of the planet's moisture is found in natural underground streams and cisterns. Page down, game. Come on. You just crashed on me, didn't you, game? You just crashed on me. Consarn it. Alright, I'm going to give it a second here. i got to read something off screen anyway, real quick. Yep, yeah, doesn't look like this is coming back at all, so... Okay. This is going to happen often enough that I think maybe I just need to get used to the idea that, um... 
I need to get used to the idea. Yes, I'm uploading stuff to my SkyDrive, folks, because that's the only freaking way I can figure out to uh, LP from or get LP stuff done from here. So I got to get somebody else to upload it for me after I send them a 7-zip file. So you've just been let in on a technical secret. At any rate, oh man, this is going to be irritating. But I think we're just going to have to get in the habit of re of uh, picking up videos because this game is going to crash. Okay, now back to it. We've already read that. Let's pick up where we left off here. The Azure was socially divided into three castes. In order of authority, these are queens, soldiers, and drones, also known as workers. Drones never make decisions of the slightest complexity without first checking with the higher-ups. Soldiers make certain limited decisions, mostly orders to drones, based on some general directive from the swarm's queen. There is only one queen per hive. The hive cluster is under attack. I just crashed the freaking game again. No, I didn't. God, that was close. Members of the Zazzle community often refer to themselves and each other as we, and are aware at all times of all instructions and data as transmitted by telepathy. Zazzle evolved in such a way that processing these vast amounts of data is intuitive and distracting, just as space truckers are able to process a constant barrage of mostly useless UV radio chatter. Wah, wah, wah. This is, the race is quite intelligent, and the Zazzle have independently developed space travel techniques, as well as a very strong aptitude for mining and light industrial production. Industrial production, I don't know where I got the word light. Their underground dwellings are highly advanced, reminiscent of high-tech rabbit burrows. These hives, or ant colonies, and they're basically ants, except they look like centipedes. These hives are composed of vast, interconnected systems of caverns and tunnels, usually carved around an underwater, underground water source. I'd say they're ripping off the Veloxi, but obviously the Veloxi are just insect monsters anyway, back in the old star flight days. The Zazzar will reproduce frequently, and new hives spring up spontaneously when a new queen lures a few soldiers and drones from existing swarms using chemical lures as well as telepathic messages. Several Zazzar colonies have been established on other worlds, where their denizens have been welcomed for their single-minded industriousness. A few early xenophobic incidents involving insecticide have been all but forgotten. And what was the other one? The veg. They can't be veg. These mobile shrubs grow to enormous heights, but can be painlessly trimmed to any height. Most veg merchants and diplomats trim back to a height of six feet for the purposes of off-world travel, and that height is now considered chic and well-groomed. In appearance, the, if the veg is a tangled mass of vines and creepers around a vegetable core. Their roots play across the floor in all directions. Their leaves often fall off, but this is painless and equivalent to other species shedding or molting. A veg can reach a top speed of nearly 0.5 kilometers per hour, but most prefer to shamble slowly around, hunching over and dragging their vines behind. Veg are highly thirsty, thirsty, highly very thirsty species, and have a habit of plopping a vine surreptitiously into any nearby liquid, be it a puddle, toilet bowl, or someone else's drink. They are only of average intelligence, but they make fantastic computer programmers and copy editors. <laughs> what? That's probably a joke about somebody who's like stealing other people's drinks in the uh, computer programming copy thinking. As the veg homeworld of Legroom has become civilized, the veg Legroom get it. The veg have gone from living in the wilds to more modern greenhouse settings with artificially controlled light and soil. Sunlight is always welcome, but it is taken for granted on their world. Water is the most precious commodity, the stuff of life, and it has become the unit of currency in veg society. That new toaster sent me back 20 gallons. The veg love mineral-rich soils and are dread fire, lightning, and insect infestation. Veg have a hard time dealing with the flesh-based species races of the galaxy, especially those that raise crops and harvest them as textiles of foodstuffs. They are particularly appalled by the practice of eating fruit, which they equate with devouring babies. The veg consider humans to be utterly contemptible. This, this stems, pardon the pun, boom, boom, back to the last century when a human... I wish they just left that stems. I probably would have missed it. I was kind of an idiot. When a human diplomat contingent arrived at the funeral of a great veg leader bearing an offering of cut flowers and fruit baskets, the veg also considered the human practice of potting household plants to be unconscionable. There are rebel movements with plants to infiltrate human society and free the plants. While the veg keep non-sentient pant plets, they always let them roam free. Anybody else we want to read about while we're here? I mean, we could read about the Nablitzi or the Niblitz, but we pretty much are done with them. We don't need to know more about them. If you really want me to read through this, let me know. And, uh, of course, the Sraffin? No, they're not called Sraffin. What were... 
Salabrasters. Yeah, and Thud is our example of a Salabraster. I can read about them if you guys really want me to. Otherwise, I think we should probably avoid spending a ton of time reading in this area. Unless we're talking about something that... Can movie reviews. This is just fun, extra content. Unless we're talking about something like a species we're about to go into their flashback and we want to learn more about them. But it occurs to me that we have now read about two species that... While we know they will not be the shapeshifter in disguise, they're probably still worth talking to. Yeah, we've... There's one of the insect dudes. Probably want to talk to him. He's probably got a flashback for us to do. And uh, in playing around off-screen, looking around, I do know that there's a plant lady we can talk to. And she's got a flashback, but I haven't done it yet. And the Matosi examine. This is a race I've never seen before. Reminds me of something I scraped off my shoe. Yes. Travelers planning to make connecting flights from the Bulbous 3 departure. Bulbasaur? I think we've heard that already. Let's greet him. Hi, my name's Alias Null. How are you? I have the cramps and nausea one normally associates with imminent fission. Fission? Oh, guy's about to reproduce. Let's ask him about himself. I bother to ask him. Well, I'll ask him about the drink better. Why not? He'll probably say the same thing. Yep, said the same thing. All right. Give me some membrane, dude. I must preserve my energies for my imminent vision. Hi, you're not from around here, are you? Sorry, I can't chat. I have to split. Boom. <laughs> All right, let's leave him alone. That was basically the... I think that species was created for the sole purpose of that joke. <laughs> but it did occur to me that we should read about another race. Not the Matosi. We should read about humans. <laughs> nice picture. The species is often called the vanilla species of the galaxy because of the lack of notable traits or special abilities. They evolved on a planet called Earth, or Terra, one of only three homeworlds not controlled by a unified political entity. Earth's dramatic variety of ecosystems may explain the human ability to adapt to a wide variety of planets. To a wide variety of planets. Therefore, there are many, there are many planets where humans are found, but few where they represent a sizable portion of the population. So you're always kind of like the minority that mm, everybody's kind of suspicious of and doesn't like. Humans feature two five-fingered hands and two five-toed feet. Their bodies are covered with a thin layer of smooth white, smooth skin, which, sorry, comes in a variety of shades ranging from very light to very dark brown. They are almost hairless except for several patches and sometimes surprising locations. There are two human genders. The male contributes genetic material to the female where fertilization occurs. The resulting embryo lives inside the female for nearly a year until it is expelled or, in human terms, born. <laughs> <laughs> an immature human offspring then takes an additional 15 to 20 years to reach adulthood. The species lacks any notable skills other than a moderate intelligence level and its famous adaptability. This combination of physical and mental abilities marks humans as ideally suited for middle management positions. <laughs> humans are considered to be highly emotional as their moods can quickly swing from joy to anger to depression. Humans employ ethyl alcohol as an intoxicant, occasionally to a dangerous extent. Excess, sorry. The unnotable contribution of human culture to the galactic culture is the art form known as slapstick humor. The most well-known practitioner of this art form is a long-dead human known as Jerry Lewis, who is revered throughout the galaxy. Oddly, he is far less respected on the human homeworld. Since all humans look alike to members of every other species, non-humans have a hard time not associating every human with the slapstick antics of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Which will be an, a recurring theme throughout this adventure. Uh, let's read about Earth as long as we're doing it. Population 12.33 billion. Note the last census of seven years ago. Surface gravity 0.92. Inhabited planet average. A small, pleasant planet in the Terran system. Earth is home to the human race. The planet's primary industries are marketing, management, tourism, and video duplication facilities. <laughs> there you go, folks. Now you know everything you need to know about the human race. Hey. Okay, this may or may not be important later to know when things are arriving. 
Got a flight coming in from Frufnia and one coming in from Hapakdol. I do remember the creatures from Hapakdol. One of them we got a flashback to deal with. But for right now, let's talk to this guy. Soldier 714Z367. With all those appendages, it seems like Zazzles would be natural born bartenders. I'm surprised you don't see more of them doing it. You wouldn't make a dent in that armor. Soldier requests you not attempt to remove his limb again. Although he would regenerate it within days, he still considers to be a socially unacceptable act. Hi, my name's Alias No. How are you? I am well. My sworn name is Soldier 714Z367. But many of the patrons refer to me as Soldier 714 for short. <laughs> yep, that's a lot shorter, all right. Let's ask him about, uh, me. Get his Jerry Lewis joke. Since all humans look alike to me, you cannot help but remind me of that great human comic, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, no, wait, uh, that's not it. I mean, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> Although I was hatched and reared on my home world of pizzazz, I was sent here on a mission by the revered Queen Zooms. Okay. To ask him about the Queen. Queen? Oh, can't ask him about the Queen. But to ask him about Thud. I feel sorry for the Salabraster. His never seems impossible to satisfy. Yeah, I picked up on that too. The Neblitz makes a most disagreeable patron. He has complained about my drink mixing, the temperature, the lighting, the music, but most of all, about his Salabraster mate. It's been forever just chatting in this game, that's a problem. Been here all day, but not said much. Uh, do we really care about what he says? Well, let's ask him about the band. I, I also think I recall you've got to talk to the band at some point. That is something that a mere Zazzle soldier would know little about. Okay, never mind. That's his default. I've got nothing to say about this. Uh, that's not going anywhere, most likely. So let's chat with him. Ah, alias. I think you need to put in disc three to make this work. Disc three. Wow. Now we're getting somewhere, folks. Now we're really getting somewhere. Probably we are on our way to crashing the game, but, uh, you know, that that's somewhere still. Can't take that away from me, folks. Oh, you can't take that away from me. So let's pop in disk 3. This means the only disk I won't have used is the Mac install disk, so yay me. I was briefly worried that I was uh, getting the wrong version of this game, but because I couldn't find any place where it said Mac versus PC. Uh, on Amazon, but it turns out that uh, they just sold one package with install disk for both systems, which seems like people would do that more often back in the day. You don't see a lot of Zazzles on Armpit 6. How'd you come to live here? It's a long story. I am not sure you have the time to hear it. Uh, I got time. I mean, I, we don't. This game's incredibly time picky, but uh, I have a, I'm almost positive I'm going to lose and have to start over and off-screen through stuff you've already seen at some point. So let's just take our time. I got lots of time and lots of curiosity. Let's hear your story. I once lived the routine life of a soldier in the service of the greatest of Zazzle queens, the revered Zunes. Ours was the finest swarm on pizzazz. I was in charge of guarding Her Majesty's tapestries, a position of great importance and responsibility. Tell me about your queen. Tell me about this queen. What's her name? Zooms? She is a lustrous and wise ruler. Of course, she is of extremely advanced age and was beginning to get somewhat eccentric. Off her flipping rocker, eh? No. She continues to be a pillar of wisdom for the swarm. She's just a few crumbs short of a full feast. <laughs> That's about life on pizzazz. 
Patty Pizzazz. Let's ask him what life on a Zazz. It's hard for me to imagine what life in a Zazzle hive must be like. It is an idyllic existence. Independent decision making is not required, and the thoughts of the entire swarm can be heard by all. So, you're a mindless automaton forced to listen to everyone's dull ramblings. Ah, oh, you make it sound unpleasant. For a Zazzle, such an environment is as soothing and protective as still being within the egg. He's being pretty tolerant of aliens. I like Alias as a character, but he can be kind of a jerk to these aliens. Ask about the future? Uh, I guess I will out of curiosity, but the past is most likely what's going to lead us to a flashback. <laughs> Look to the future, to but I remember no, the past. My orders are to remain here on armpit six. He is proof that the of American course, it is possible that I may someday get a countermanding order. So why'd you leave, Pizzazz? It was such a strange day. Even now, it feels almost like a dream. Oh, I was waiting the for that. Oh, thought we were going to get our little the flashback right there. Festival of Ooze. I was left behind to guard the tapestries. They left to learn the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Yes, I said they're... Ooh. Attention, Soldier 714Z367. I have chosen you to carry out a vital mission imperative to the ongoing survival of the Zazzle. Mm -hmm. This mission is secret and must be carried out with the utmost haste and discretion. For two years I have been nursing an egg. Okay. The egg of a new and glorious Zazzle queen. Kind of figured. The time has come for the egg to hatch. And I have chosen you to take the egg to the location of the new hive. It has become clear to me that for the continued good of the Zazzle, mm -hmm. we must expand beyond Pizzazz, okay. which may not always be able to support us. Oh. Instead, we must I crush the Protoss. Oh. Planet for the nest of the new hive. Yep. Armpit six. Okay. In a distant star system. Gotcha. You must take the egg and ensure its safe passage to the new home. Sure. I am fatigued from our interaction and must rest. You have done a lot of the talking. I will meet you upon your arrival at the shuttle bay before you depart. Thank you. You will be blessed by the many compound eyes of Zoizos. <laughs> cool. All right, now I believe there's a way to get this compound vision to go away. Uh, I think I remember reading that there's something you can do about that. I sure hope so, because this is getting old fast. Control schedule, great mess hall, repeat every hecto tick. Uh, you guys got a list of commands anywhere? It would be really helpful. I think there's one in the hard copy manual, but I don't have that at my fingertips at the moment. Okay, well, let's just uh, take a moment and uh, review the stuff that is not affected by compound vision, because doing this thing in compound vision will get old fast. Cart loading area, lookout, mine, battle station, food preparation, mess hall, pool room, great hall, egg. Where's the egg? I see these little green flashies. Looks like we've got a maze sort of puzzle. Hopefully more puzzle and less maze than, say, some of the sh stuff that we came across in, like, Zach McCracken and Galgo 13. But it's difficult to say at this point. Uh, we don't have anything in our inventory right now. We've got the map. I just got done looking at this. Yeah, it looks like we're going to be rolling the egg around through kind of a puzzle area. Yeah.
Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. This seems like a good place to stop, particularly because I don't know how to get compound eye vision to go away, and that's going to be a problem after a while. So let's uh, call it a video here. When we come back, uh, we have to help Soldier 7, Zark 7, whatever his name is, um, get this egg safely to armpit 6, 5, I don't know, 7, armpit something. Let's uh, hope that we get it to the correct armpit. And um, that a wonderful new colony of super intelligent insect monsters will evolve. And, uh, and Grimoth R will be thrilled with his LP, which I'm sure he's watching closely because it's got ants in it, sort of, kind of. Anyway, thanks for watching, folks, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.